It's Patrick Hutzel from IntensiveCareHotline.com, where we instantly improve the lives for families of critically ill patients in intensive care so that you can make informed decisions, have peace of mind, real power, real control, and so that you can influence decision-making fast, even if you're not a doctor or a nurse in intensive care. This is another episode of Your Questions Answered. And in last week's episode, I answered another question from one of my clients. And the question in the last episode was, is it time for my dad to go to a step-down unit after he's come off the ventilator or is it too early to leave ICU? You can check out last week's episode by clicking on the link below this video. In this week's episode of Your Questions Answered, I want to continue answering the next questions regarding James and Christine's dad in intensive care who's had a hemorrhagic stroke. James and Christine's dad had a brain decompression where they evacuated a large bleed from his brain after the hemorrhagic stroke. Following on, their dad also underwent a craniectomy, which is basically a partial removal of the skull to decrease the brain pressures after the brain bleed. James and his sister Christine were getting their dad in one of the best hospitals in the United States, the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. In the meantime, their dad was getting a tracheostomy because he couldn't be weaned off the ventilator and the breathing tube. He also at the same time had a PEG tube for feeding inserted. Their dad also had ongoing seizures due to the stroke and his anti-seizure medications and they needed to be optimized so he could wake up and progress to neurology rehabilitation. So in today's episode of Your Questions Answered, I answer a series of questions again from James and his sister Christine again, and that are all excerpts from various one-on-one -on -one phone and email consulting and advocacy sessions with me. And the topic this week, as part of this series of one-on-one -on -one consulting and advocacy sessions with me, is how to wean off ventilation and tracheostomy step by step. You can also read or watch previous episodes of the one-on-one -on -one consulting and advocacy with James and his sister Christine by clicking on the links below this video. And if you are watching this on YouTube, just click on the link below this video. That'll get you to our website where you can access the written version of this blog and where you can also access other episodes of your questions answered and other free resources. So James writes in his first email. Hi Patrick, I think they dropped the pressure support on the ventilator down to 8 from 10. What does it mean? Also my dad's oxygen saturation is 97%. And also where would I find an arterial blood gas? Many thanks from James. So here is my response. Hi James. Yes, they dropped the pressure support from 10 down to 8. And thanks for attaching the picture of the ventilator so I can actually see it. So that's actually a good sign and they should be moving swiftly in taking your dad off the ventilator at least for a few hours for a trial. You can also see in the picture that his tidal volumes on the top of the screen have dropped from 625 mils in the last picture to you sent to now 490 mils. The question here is what is his oxygen saturation, which you can see on the monitor, and also what are his arterial blood gases or ABGs like? I assume they have stopped monitoring ABGs for now. Also, his breaths per minute are 24 and should stay less than 30 per minute. Per minute. As a rate, higher than 30 breaths per minute would indicate discomfort, pain, 
potential infection, shortness of breath, and so forth. ABGs you will also only find if your dad has an arterial line. If you send me a picture of the monitor with the vital signs, I can tell you if he has an arterial line or not. I assume he doesn't have an arterial line after four weeks in ICU, but you never know. Very happy for you or your sister to give me a call and we can discuss further or just simply send me an email. So here is James' response. Hi Patrick, my father is sound asleep. He looked really great today. His eyes were wide open and he scribbled a bit on a piece of paper trying to write his name. We believe he understands what the doctors are saying and he is becoming more anxious and angry because of it. Please advise of your thoughts and suggestions. As explained before, we really need to see him off the ventilator here and avoid LTAC, also known as long-term acute care. The seizure doctor said he's keeping his dose of Keppra at 1500 milligrams twice a day and Dilantin 100 milligrams three times a day for the next three to six months. What are your thoughts on the above? Many thanks from James. So here is my response. Hi James, it's great to hear that your dad is more and more awake with eyes wide open, trying to write, etc. That's really encouraging. I do understand that the more awake and alert he gets, the more frustrated he might become because of his difficult situation. Having said all of that, please keep in mind that the vast majority of patients in ICU, especially after prolonged natural or induced coma, don't remember anything or much uh, of their ICU stay. Therefore, if you can diffuse any anger or frustration, it would be very helpful. Strategies around that would be to keep him occupied, mobilizing physical therapy, talking about positive things, etc. Even if he's making sense now, chances are he won't remember any of it in the future. I do remember yesterday discussing about being transparent with him when we were on the phone. And generally speaking, I support that. However, if he's getting too upset, you may want to soften your explanation of the situation slightly. Kepra, 1500 milligrams times two, is still a very high dose. Dilantin 3 times 100 mg is more of a normal dose. The goal is to keep him seizure free. If they think that's the dose that will achieve that, I would support that for now. It can definitely be revisited at a later stage. As long as he keeps getting more awake, stays seizure free and can be weaned off the ventilator, that's the goal. Any questions, please let me know. Here is James' response. Hi Patrick, please provide your thoughts on the ventilator settings again. I'm still trying to make sense of it. My father is awake and alert right now. It's 11.30 at night. He had a long nap. I have attached another picture of the ventilator, if you can please uh, comment on that. Now, before I go into the answer to James's question, if you have watched thus far, and if you want one-on-one -on -one phone and email consulting and advocacy with me, please go on our website and click on the top of the website where it says counseling and consulting and choose from the options that work best for you. So here's my response. Hi James, nothing has changed from your last picture. The settings are still the same as far as I can see. What I can't quite make out is the pressure support it looks like it's sitting still at 8, like in the previous picture, but it could also read like 0, but that would be very unusual and very unlikely. The only thing that has changed is that his tidal volumes, which is the volumes in mils per breath, are slightly lower, 392 mils compared to 490 mils in the picture you sent through earlier today. 
It's no big deal as long as his oxygen saturation stays above 92% and his carbon dioxide stays within range, sort of 35 to 45 millimeter per mercury. It's most likely a sign of him being asleep. Generally speaking, those are good settings to get through the night because they are minimal support and again, he should have time off the ventilator very soon. I would suggest tomorrow daytime. Also, have you found out if your dad has an arterial line? Now, Chris, it, James' sister is emailing back to my email and Christine says, Hi Patrick, this is James' sister Christine. What are your thoughts on what we could be doing for rehabilitation or exercises for my dad? As you know, he has been in the hospital bed for four and a half weeks now. As you know, he's still on the tracheostomy with ventilation and still trying to wean him off the ventilator. I see you just started putting him in the once a day for an hour with a helmet on his head. What else can we do? I did notice a little water building up on his right side where he's expected to have problems due to the brain bleed on the left side. Also, the seizure team decided to keep him at 3000 mg Kepra now and dilant him 300 mg per day for the next six months. What's your experience or thoughts with this? Thank you so much from Christine. So here is my response. Hi Christine, in terms of rehabilitation, for now the focus will be to keep mobilizing him and keep getting him out of bed. This can be supported by arm and leg movement. They should be doing this in the morning and in the afternoon for as long as he can tolerate it, including the movements of the limbs. One hour per day is not enough as long as he can tolerate it and as long as he's seizure free. The longer he can sit out of bed, the stronger he will get. And this includes strengthening his respiratory or breathing muscles that will help him to get off the ventilator and the tracheostomy. Also, getting him out of bed during the day will help him to sleep at night because it'll make him tired. Many patients in ICU have a disturbed day and night rhythm because of lack of fresh air, lack of natural daylight, noise, lights, etc. If he can go on to neurology rehabilitation, this would be preferred rather than long-term acute care or LTAC simply because the stroke rehabilitation should be the focus and not weaning him off the ventilator. Hopefully they can wean him while he's in ICU. As far as the Kepra and Dilantin are concerned, the Kepra dose is fairly high, whereas the Dilantin dose is fairly normal. However, keeping your dad seizure free for now is more important than worrying about the high doses of Kepra. Seizures could be a setback for your dad, including weaning him off the ventilator. I hope this helps for now. Please let me know if you want to discuss and we can get on the phone as well. So, here is a response from James. Hi Patrick, we are trying to consolidate. My father has now been on the tracheostomy collar two hours earlier and had been on for another hour now. Please let me know your thoughts. Hi James, that's really great news. That's a fantastic start. If they can continue doing that and continuously increase the time off the ventilator where he comes to the point where he can stay off the ventilator during the day and being ventilated overnight, he will have come a long way. Quote unquote normal weaning of the ventilator with tracheostomy goes as follows. Number one, get off the ventilator onto the tracheostomy collar for one to two hours, then back on ventilator and assess effectiveness of such, including breathing pattern, oxygen saturation, as well as arterial blood gases whenever an arterial catheter is present. Next, number two, increase the time off the ventilator during the daytime 
one to two hours off the ventilator back to one to two hours on the ventilator until the time off the ventilator can be gradually increased so that patients can stay off the ventilator throughout the day. Once patients can stay off the ventilator during the daytime and quote unquote only need nighttime ventilation, they should be able to eventually not be needing nighttime ventilation as well. Timelines around the process may vary from a few days to a few weeks or even months. In rare cases, patients will need tracheostomy ventilation for the rest of their lives. If they do need tracheostomy ventilation for prolonged periods, the best option is intensive care at home services. As I mentioned before, ICU is often two steps forward and one step back. Therefore, if things progress for now, there may well be setbacks later. The weaning process should be supported by ongoing mobilization, as breathing tends to be easier in a chair and also breathing and respiratory muscles will be strengthened with mobilization. This should also be supported by chest physiotherapy. I hope it all makes sense. Any questions, please let me know. So, look out for the next consulting and advocacy session with James and Christine next week, and I'll see you then. But how can you become the best advocate for your critically ill loved one? How can you make informed decisions, get peace of mind, control, power and influence quickly whilst your loved one is critically ill in intensive care. You get to that all-important feeling of making informed decisions, get peace of mind, control, power and influence when you download your free instant impact report now by entering your email below. In your free instant impact report, you will learn quickly how to make informed decisions, get peace of mind, real power and real control, and how you can influence decision-making fast whilst your loved one is critically ill in intensive care. Your free Instant Impact Report gives you in-depth insight that you must know whilst your loved one is critically ill or is even dying in intensive care. Sign up and download your free Instant Impact Report now by entering your email below. In your free Instant Impact Report, you will learn how to speak the secret intensive care language so that the doctors and the nurses know straight away that you are an insider and that you know and understand what's really happening in intensive care. In your free report, you will also discover how to ask the doctors and the nurses the right questions. Discover the many competing interests in intensive care and how your critically ill loved one's treatment may depend on those competing interests. How to eliminate fear, frustration, stress, struggle and vulnerability even if your loved one is dying. You get five mind-blowing tips and strategies helping you to get on the right path to making informed decisions, get peace of mind, control, power and influence in your situation. You will get real-world examples that you can easily adapt to your and your critically ill loved one's situation. How to stop being intimidated by the intensive care team and how you will be seen 
as equals. You will get crucial behind the scenes insight so that you know and understand what is really happening in intensive care and how you need to manage doctors and nurses in intensive care and it's not what you think. Thank you for tuning into this week's Your Questions Answered episode and I'll see you again next week in another update. Make sure you also have a look at our blog section for more tips and strategies or simply send me an email to support at intensivecarehotline.com with your questions. Also, have a look at our membership site intensivecaresupport.org for families of critically ill patients in intensive care. Or you can call me, find phone numbers on the top of the website. Also, have a look at our ebook section and you can also get one-on-one -on -one consulting and advocacy with me via Skype over the phone or via email by clicking on the relevant tabs on the top of the website. This is Patrick Hutzel from IntensiveCareHotline.com and I'll see you again next week in another update.